Relax, have a ciggy. You're listening to the Power Movement. Welcome to another episode of the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week on the program, I have Chris Jameson. He's known throughout the world as JMO, and he's had an amazing career. It started in the snowboard world when snowboarding was in its infancy. I was referred to JMO by one of my friends, the Super Frenchie, Matthias Gerard, who I'll have on the program at some point. He has a ridiculous story. He's one of those base jumpers that didn't land one, and he's still here today. Matias told me I needed to speak with JMO as he was one of the most intriguing personalities in action sports. We sat down at his startup in Bend, Oregon, and man, this guy's interesting. Between sports, media, and technology, JMO has done so much from hosting the Olympics to being employee number 30 at GoPro. We talk about his amazing career. And before we do that, I need to thank you for listening to the podcast. If you ever have any feedback for me, you can reach me at mike at thepowellmovement.com. I'd also appreciate it if you shared my social posts and reviewed me wherever you listen to your podcasts. I also need to thank my sponsors. They are Evo.com, DieCutStickers.com, Sierra at Tahoe, Rescue Water, and Unofficial Networks. They support me and make the show happen, so please support them. Now, let's talk to JMO. So I'm sitting here in a startup in Bend, Oregon. Pretty cool space, lots of cool art on the walls. It's a technology-focused startup. It's Evo Gimbals. I'm sitting here with Chris Jameson. Chris is known as JMO throughout the snowboard world. He's got a great story, but first, let's start with what the hell is Evo Gimbals? All right. Well, Evo is... And no commercial, just the quick Reader's Digest. How about the slow Reader's Digest? Well, I hear you can get on tangent, so I'm (laughs) supposed to like reel you in. (laughs) Okay. That's true. That's funny. Who told you that? I wonder. Everyone. Everyone. (laughs) Okay. Um... (laughs) Evo Gimbals is a startup based on the experience of a group of old school Bend Oregonians uh, like myself, particularly Peter Coughlin and Hans Shearshaw from Shearshaw Ski Shops. His grandfather was one of the original founders of Mount Bachelor. We're all kind of grew up in this content media nerd crew and bend and we have this beautiful little startup uh, about a year and a half old now called Evo Gimbals. We make everything from custom quadcopters, big ones, to carry uh, heavy-duty payloads and zipline cams. And we also have a line of consumer product, which is uh, stabilizing three-axis gimbals for cell phones, smartphones, GoPros, all the different action cameras, as well as mirrorless units and larger 2,000-gram-ish you know, DSLR packages and things like that. And we're just out to help the world keep it smooth. Well, I guess you missed the commercial part, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know how else other to say it. Yeah. That's what it is. Well, they make camera stabilization devices. There's five companies right now that are on Kickstarter yep. trying to raise funds to do exactly what you guys have been doing for a year and a yep. half. Yep. And you're the only people in America doing it, right? Yeah, we're the only U.S.-based uh, manufacturer. Yep. And, and you make all your stuff here in the States? We do Absolutely everything from shipping and receiving to marketing, design, firmware development right here in this room that you're sitting in. Not so much this table, but in the offices that you can go see later if you want to. Do you have any foreign people working for you? Good question. Yes, we do in the way that my buddy Hans, because he's been a RC quadcopter drone nerd for you know over a decade, like since way before drones were even something. He was getting beat up by making copters when he was a kid. <laughs> no, no. I, I think everybody was stoked on it because he's been attaching cameras and stuff to these things he's been making, like I said, since way before it was cool. But anyway, he used to travel to Shenzhen all the time to get custom batteries built for these crazy giant quads that he was building, right? Do you see this coming? He ends up meeting a woman in Shenzhen, born and raised electronics family girl in Shenzhen and ended up marrying her. So she's here with us every day. She's wonderful. She runs all of our uh, business operations for all of our manufacturing in Shenzhen. And she's an owner in the company and married to one of my buddies. (laughs) Okay. So when you say all your manufacturing in Shenzhen, Mm -hmm. does that mean everything's not made in the States? 
the only thing we do in the States is firmware development and marketing and everything is happening in this building, shipping and receiving. But no, no, no. You have to have things made in Shenzhen. It's the electronics capital of the world. They are the kingpins of electronics manufacturing. Have you been? Oh, it's a it's incredible. Place so, is what's nuts. the weirdest thing you've eaten when you're in Shenzhen? I don't get weird. I stay. I stay. Don't Western. you have to to respect the factory owners? They take you out to dinner. They buy you this big feast, and you're supposed to respect them by drinking and eating exactly what they put in front of you. When I'm doing the Asia Pacific Rim, whether it's uh, surf trips, Bali, whatever, I'm not on the business end of things for one, and uh, I, I keep things pretty mellow, man. I'm not a big like weird partier guy. But when yeah. someone who owns a factory there wants to take I, you I out. I don't have to hang out with the factory guys. That's what my buddies do. Okay. Yeah. I just go on surf trips and test product. I don't do weird bars with geisha girls and different things like that. Okay. Well, I wasn't asking about all that yeah. stuff. But, uh, <laughs> with all the podcasts, I like to find out a little bit about everybody and their youth. And it sounds like you grew up in Hawaii. Were you born there? How do you know all this? I know this way too much about you. Yeah. Okay. I kind of grew up in Hawaii. My family is originally from the Eugene Corvallis area, just on the other side of the hill. Hippies? No. Nah. I don't know. There's a lot of that in Eugene, yeah, right? Yeah. No, they're just more humans, you know? They're not hippies, though. They're pretty straight up, good old fashioned, just humans, people. They're rad. My uncles and aunts and cousins and all that. And they're still over there in Eugene Corvallis area. But my dad's a photographer and we moved to Maui when I was a young kid because he got a job there doing a bunch of photography stuff. And that was during the 70s. And uh, I was in Hawaii from 74 to 84. You know, we'd travel back to Oregon, obviously, and visit family. So you moved there when you're four? Yeah, I lived there from four until I was 13. I've been to Hawaii once. I don't know anything about Hawaii, except for the people weren't very friendly to me. I was the minority, which is fine, but it was a different experience for me being the white kid from Seattle. I will never understand yeah. being judged on a level of some other people, but I definitely felt it in Hawaii. Did you? I was there in the 70s, and my dad was a photographer, and my mom was a mom, and no. I mean, I just... I was just a kid, you know, I don't know. I just went to the beach and ate food and went to school and it was the seventies and I rode my skateboard and do you I, surf at all while you were there? Yeah, I love surfing. Yeah. I mean, I definitely learned to surf uh, in the seventies. In fact, I got my first surfboard from Jerry Lopez because Jerry Lopez was, um, my dad was one of the photographers for lightning bolt when Jerry Lopez started at lightning bolt, him and his partner, this other guy named Dana Edmonds, who still lives on Oahu. And uh, I remember the day that Jerry Lopez came in and handed me my first surfboard ever. It was red with a white deck and a big red lightning bolt on it. That's insane. <laughs> yeah. And then Jerry ended up moving to Bend, which is really funny. Yeah. Yeah. That... So Jerry's lived in Bend forever and him and I are friends and he gets to laugh at how he knew me when I was a little kid. That is full circle and funny. Yeah. Random, huh? Yeah. Did you play any team sports growing up? Nope. Never? Nope. Skateboarding has always been the, the catalyst for everything that I've done. I still skateboard to this day. In fact, there's a super badass new park from Evergreen Skate Parks about a half mile that way from these very microphones. So I skate all the time during lunch and I just love skating, man. It's the epicenter of, of everything that I do, for sure. You're 14 years old and you move back to Oregon you might have your first crush on a girl, you might have a best friend, and then all of a sudden you're moving back to the mainland. Any relationship or anything you had are pretty much dead at that point, right? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Sure. I guess you're right. Yeah. I mean, my friends that I had, I, I had to wave goodbye and say, hey, man, it's been great. And But you didn't care? You were like, fine to go to Oregon? Because uh, at 14, it's kind of a big age or 13. So, I mean, I see your point, but by the way, I'm super impressed at your background of how these little things that you know about me. <laughs> Very impressed. So I can't actually speak for your age, but you are similar. In I am age. 43. Okay. So 43. So you are in a similar category. I was I uh, the Pal Peralta right. boards with shit spitting out of them. You yeah. were the age before that and then into that. Yeah. So life for us at that point was a lot more based on the purity of of just pure enjoyment. We we weren't trying to get sponsored because that didn't exist. Yeah. It wasn't a, it just wasn't there. We were 
not trying to be cool on Instagram. We weren't trying to take pictures of anything other than my dad was a photographer, but every time he hit the trigger on his camera, it cost five bucks. So, you know, it's not the same thing as the youth of today are dealing with a whole separate mechanism than we dealt with. So did I- Are you talking about guns in school? Yeah, yeah. totally. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> Not exactly, but, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, now that you bring it up, I mean, that is one thing. But yeah, you know, we were purists by default. And so- You were when, doing it for the feeling. Yeah, we were just, I, I was just a kid, you know? I don't know, when it was time to leave, I, I waved goodbye and, and maybe probably shed a tear at the time. It was a long time ago. And now I'm going to take a break for sponsors. And my first sponsor is Evo.com. They are the premier online ski, snowboard, bike, skate, surf, clothing, and outerwear website. And they have stores in Denver, Seattle, and Portland. And their stores are insane. You don't want to miss out on their Black Friday sale. It happens this Friday, and you're going to save up to 60% on the season's best gear and brands. And price drops will be added throughout the sale. As always, you'll get a no-hassle return policy, free shipping on orders of $50 or more, and you'll get 10% off your Evo orders when you use the code capital TPM, the number 10 at checkout. You're not going to find better prices in-store or online, and their Black Friday sale is something not to be missed. So check out Evo.com, or better yet, head to their stores and take care of all of your holiday shopping needs. My next sponsor is DieCutStickers.com. And let me tell you, you're not going to find a better print adhesive service anywhere else. The guys at Die Cut Stickers are the most personal, the best business people in the sticker world. I've personally known them for over a decade, and they treat everyone like family, including their clients. They have a brand new 12,000-foot state-of-the-art facility where they make your branding dreams a reality. If you're working with someone else, call up Die Cut Stickers and get a quote. I know that you're going to find the pricing, the service, and everything else that goes along with Die Cut better than what you're currently using. And when you place your first order with Die Cut Stickers, they're going to give you 10% off for just listening to the Powell movement. All you need to do is input the code DCS15 or mention it on the phone when you request a quote and you'll get 10% off your first order with die cut stickers. Those are the first set of sponsors. Now, let's get back to JMO. We rolled back into Oregon and I remember the day I got off the plane, we flew into Corvallis actually and I got on my skateboard and there was a little grade school down the street and I skated down to the the grade school just to go s- skate, right? Cuz I figured there were some banks or something. Yeah. I got down there and sure enough there's this other kid on a skateboard. And his name is Sean Donnell. I'm like, hey, hi, I'm Chris Jameson. Hi, how's it going? And he's like, I'm Sean. And we've been best friends ever since. And he was the main chief graphic designer at Lib Tech and GNU for 15 years or something. I mean, Sean created the look. The iconic graphics that everybody knows are, are, are his all graphics. All his graphics. And we've been best friends ever since that day. I was just hanging out with him, you know, last week. All of us got together and did some stuff. But, you know, life moves on and you just, you, know, you keep focused on your path and it, it all turns out good. Yeah. yeah. So you get back here and you need a family activity to be together. Skiing is the family activity. What do you remember from your first few times skiing? And how soon do you actually hear about the new sport of snowboarding? Yeah. In 1984, it was pretty much immediately because, of course, we, I mean, all my buddies, we had subscriptions to Thrasher Mag. The yeah. right? <laughs> of course. Yeah. So Thrasher started having pictures of snowboarding in there of Scott Downey and Jeff Gurrell and Steve Caballero riding those funny old yellow Sims boards, which would, had like a wooden skateboard deck on top with like that weird yellow okay. plastic thing, you know? And of course we were like, whoa, God, got to give me some of that. Yeah. You know? And uh, so we all went out and bought some and it would snow in Corvallis a little bit and we would drive over to Bend and do like our vacations over here and yeah so we were skiing and snowboarding and obviously snowboarding in powder and then skiing on the hard pack days and then uh yeah 1987 rolled around and i was graduating from high school and we were just pretty much living in bend full time at that point you know we're just driving over so much it just happened and you attempted college at that point too right man that's amazing i went to osu for the fall term of 1987 you're blowing my mind right now, oh, by the way. Oh, it's just beginning. Oh, Jesus, how do you yeah, know all it's this? It's just beginning. This is kind of weird. Luckily, you're pretty cool. I've been I'd... following you for two weeks. <laughs> I've talked to every friend you have. Oh, my God. This is so funny. 
So I went to college and, and signed up for the broadcasting program at OSU. You got a good voice. Uh, thank you. I was just interested in journalism, you know, and photography, not so much following my dad's thing, but just like newspaper and journalism and writing. And so I, I went to OSU for the fall term of 1987. What kind of kid are you at this point? Just like a dirtbag skater? Or uh, I'm a skateboarder. But you're, just, you're wearing a Thrasher t-shirt or a cab t-shirt. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say I was like a dirtbag. I was just a kid who liked to go surfing. And Every skateboarder was a dirtbag at that point, though, I thought. It. Okay, maybe I was a dirtbag. You're Vision Streetwear wearing that kind I, of kid? I drove a 1968 VW bus. I loved that car. It was my first car. Drove it to California all over. I drove it all the way to Calgary, Alberta for the <laughs> Olympics in 1988. Huh. I know. Weird. Why would I want to go to the Olympics? I have no idea. You went back later on, I think, too, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I drove with Mike Estes. It was Mike Estes, Eldon Hardgraves, a couple barfoot guys. I think we might have picked up Ken Ockenbach on the way. Yeah, so maybe I was a dirtbag. I'm not sure. But I was a clean dirtbag for sure. Yeah, and the school thing, I, I did the term, but then after that term, it was just moving too slow for me. So my parents had bought a new place in Bend, same house they still live in today, little thousand square foot little cabin thing up in the woods. It's pretty rad. And I basically ended up getting a job at Hoodoo Ski Bowl, just being a ditch digger at Hoodoo Ski Bowl. I don't know why Mount Bachelor wouldn't hire me. Because you were a dirtbag. <laughs> Oh, because I was a dirtbag. Yeah, so I did that, and then I started snowboarding as much as I could, like when I wasn't digging fencing out at Hoodoo Ski Bowl. And how many people are snowboarding at this point? Because at this point, it's early. What kind of board are you riding? Uh, I'm riding a GNU. Okay. I'm riding a GNU at this point. I'd met Mike Olson and Pete Sari in 1987 up on the, the glacier. Yeah. They were up there with Mike Ranquit, Dan Donnelly, Matt Cummins. There might have been a couple other people up there, Mike and Pete. And I ran into them up there and I was on a Sims and they were like, come snowboarding with us, try one of our boards. So I rode with them and then they gave me, they said, oh, get rid of that Sims. We make ours in Seattle. Those are California boards. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, all right. And Mike and I got along really well and Pete. And so they gave me the board and I started riding their boards and on the day they gave you that board, didn't you have a photo taken of you that <laughs> ended right. up as a cover? That's like right. The first time you ever rode a GNU, you were on a cover of like some international it, snowboard it was, magazine. Uh, it was the first full color, full color magazine throughout the entire magazine, like no zine pages, but color throughout glossy print snowboard magazine issue. It was international snowboard magazine. Yeah. November 1987. And I had the cover. That's true. So you get float a GNU snowboard. At that point, you feel like you're part of the GNU crew. Those guys are like the shit. In terms of the riders that you're naming, if you look back now, there are some influential names that really helped sure. change the sport. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. At that point, did anybody know of them? I knew Ranquit. Nobody really knew Dan. I mean, Dan with Donnelly was a uh, Baker guy, Mount Vernon, Craig Kelly, Posse. I knew Ranquit because I was so into skating. And Mike Ranquit is a phenomenal skateboarder like frankly i think he's a better skateboarder than he is a snowboarder man that guy can rip and back then he was known throughout the willamette valley and the portland seattle skate zone everybody knew Ranquit because he was badass that guy ripped he still does i mean he <laughs> still rips to this day moving forward do you keep in touch with mike and pete absolutely i'm still riding mervin no well to not today they give oh, you that GNU yeah. board, and GNU's their baby, right? Oh, Maybe. yeah, yeah. You know, I fully was psyched out of my mind. I started riding them, and we were going to contests together. We did the GNU meal, that crazy weird movie that everybody should see because it was weird before weird was cool, for okay. sure. <laughs> the GNU meal. It's got some classic footage in it. And Matt Cummins was in the picture then at that point, and Matt and I hit it off really well. And yeah, we were just all just good friends. It was easy for all of us to work together. It eventually, with snowboarding and all these sports, you have teams and athletes, and they're not calling you an athlete at that point, I wouldn't think. It didn't exist. Was there even a thought of team, or, or is it just your crew? Um, I guess I see the question. Did GNU have a pro snowboard Yeah, team? we had a pro snowboard team. And, and Rankwit we was on that? And Rankwit was on it. There was a brochure. We went to the, the trade show. Were you in that brochure? Yes, okay. yes. And I was in that brochure. So you were on the team? Yeah, 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 yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I was I was on the team. But it's not like there was like income. I'm not even sure why we had a team. 
to make these sports cool, you can't just sell a board. Right. Yeah. We had a team. Yeah. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. There was a team. We were in ads. We had brochures. And, yeah. There was and money spent on marketing. It wasn't just like yeah. a mail order by LibTech. Yeah. Or made no, in okay. Seattle. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So, yeah, I was on the team. Yeah. And my name was printed. Did it give you a sense of pride that you're on the snowboard team? Did you grow up skateboarding and you probably saw all the skate teams? Yeah. I definitely had a sense of pride out of it. And it was very exciting because nobody liked us. It's exciting to be part of something that you believe in so much that you want to share it with the world and get everybody to understand that it's really cool. And I love skiing. But at that time, I mean, snowboarding was like blackball, you know, it was there. Nobody did it. Chicks didn't dig it. You know, it wasn't like you were doing it for the girls or something. But it was so exciting because we knew how much potential it had, especially riding powder. You know, powder was... I mean, it just made sense. Oh, and skis were so crappy back then. They, they were just were 68 horrible. 68 millimeters underfoot. Horrible. So you would just slay pow on these old crappy snowboards, right? And you just wanted to share that with people. Like, man, you guys, put the skis away if it's not hard pack because these things work and they are beautiful. And that was what really made it exciting is that it wasn't easy. There was a challenge of yeah. trying to let people know how wonderful this experience was. And that's what being part of that team was about. And then eventually that shits the bed. Something happens with the books or I don't know. Um, no, it was. Or the banks or. The, basically, and again, I'm saying this fully in speculative terms just sort of like i think this is what yeah, happened no, like, i mean it's a podcast you can say whatever you want i have no facts yeah yeah that's I have fine no facts to back this up at all there was a distribution company called windline that had something to do with windsurfing they were somehow connected with europe and this is when windsurfing was just exploding off the hook so Winline had come in and I had nothing to do with this because Mike and Pete own the company. So they were the ones that- You're part of the team. I'm just part of the team and I'm their buddies. But somewhere in there, they signed this distribution deal with Winline and then they were making the boards in Austria and the boards got totally screwed up in some ski factory. And there was money and contracts and this Winline company basically came in and screwed Mike and Pete really is what happened. And Mike and Pete, bless their hearts you know they're incredibly successful today and they have stuck with their ways but if you go back to the old mike and pete they were really just a couple kids you know mad scientist experimenters and they got taken advantage of of by windline windline screwed them and it killed gnu and gnu was gone for a year and a half two years yeah. it, it disappeared it was a it was a dead company it was gone when that company goes you're still in touch with Mike and Pete and everybody. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. they're pretty bummed on this whole deal. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. just crushed. They like, were hey. crushed. Yeah. And yeah. it takes them a little while maybe to like figure out their new plan, which yeah. they came back with with authority. But what do you do at that point? You're still riding a GNU or do you say, no, well, I will yeah. never ride this board again because they screwed my friends? The boards were – the windline people screwed the manufacturing so bad on them that the boards were pretty weird and they were really hard to ride. They were super stiff. I just wrote a bunch of different stuff, actually. I wrote a bunch of Sims boards for a while because I had some friends at Were you Sims. getting sent boards from people? Yeah, yeah. People You're not were, buying snowboard gear, right? You no, know, I wasn't buying gear at the time. You know, friends were taking care of me and stuff. I had some sweet Sims boards that I rode that Tom Sims hooked me up with. Tom Sims and I, oddly, were pretty got along pretty well and it was kind of weird you know that's the thing that's really funny is i actually never really ridden for any of the other companies but tom sims and jake burton for that matter i've never done business with burton ever but i've always had this like kind of pretty good relationship with jake burton like just always seeing each other hey hanging out and <laughs> that's you know it was kind of cool but anyway i guess that's a little off off subject i'm gonna cut you yeah. off real quick i heard you actually went that year to like plate setup. Oh, yeah, yeah. I rode, I rode a bunch of hot uh, Regis Roland race boards a bunch. That was radical. They were good. And that was right after GNU, right? You just went into like a race boot setup? Yeah. I mean, I would wear soft boots and pow, but I was riding a bunch of race boards. Yeah, it was radical. The thing is, it was so cool about the race boards. The Regis Roland was making these boards that were just so much, like as far as turning goes, none of the U.S. freestyle designs could turn worth a worth No a side damn. cut? 
No side cut. They were horrible snowboards. They were fine, sort of, I guess, but they were bad snowboards. And these race boards were so fun. God, you could just mob on these things and you could go so fast. I had a good time on those boards. They were cool. And now it's time for me to jump into my last sponsor break. And the first sponsor here is Rescue Water. And Rescue Water is all about proactive recovery. You're probably wondering, what is proactive recovery? Well, I think of it like this. If I'm really tired, I'll skip coffee or soda and I'll grab an energy drink. And when I really need to hydrate, like when I'm working out, which I don't do, going out or getting out there, I skip the sports drink and I drink a cold rescue water. It replaces the electrolytes much better than your traditional sports drink. And really, I drink it before bed to stay hangover free. It works. And head over to rescuewater.com for a special holiday offer. They're going to give you 20% off a 12-pack case when you enter the code R-E-S-Q water T-P-M. In caps or lowercase, it doesn't matter. What does matter is how good you're going to feel after you drink one. Finally, if you're planning a trip to the Tahoe area, look no further than Sierra at Tahoe. They are the only Tahoe resort that is certified unserious and delivers an amazing value. And they operate a little differently than most. For those who wonder how they got the corduroy so fresh, they chalk that up to the rare herd of groomicorns and their trainer who Sierra brought in from parts unknown. Those butter smooth park jibs? Credit that to Sierra's posse of gnomes. Yes, gnomes. The only thing you won't find at Sierra is a Starbucks or long lift lines. If you live in the area or are planning a trip to Tahoe, head over to sierraattahoe.com for more information. Now, let's get back to JMO. In 1992, Mike and Pete put LibTech together. Exactly. And you're looked at, I think, as like the first writer for LibTech, right? Uh, well, it was Matt Cummins and I. Okay. So, yeah, I, I can't say I'm the first it, because Matt and I were there together. In fact, here's a weird one for you. Matt Cummins and I, before we were told about LibTech, before Mike and Pete had called us, Matt and I were sharing a hotel room at the US Open in Vermont. And we were in our hotel room one night and Matt and I started talking to each other and like, man, we just need to make our own snowboard company. And do you remember the, the company Joyride? Oh, it's one of my questions. I didn't oh. realize that happened beforehand. That happened before. And that's why it was such a quick thing, right? Well, yeah. So what happened is Matt Cummins actually made the name up. Matt, we were like throwing names around and Matt goes, Joyride. And I'm like, oh my God, that's it. Joyride Snowboards, we're doing it. And let's like use art. We'll get Sean Donnell to draw the art for us. And uh, Sean Donnell drew up the original board. I found these guys that lived here in Bend that were actually from Gilcrest and they had uh, trust funds from their lumber family kids from the Gilcrest Lumber Company. And so I hit them up and I was like, dude, you guys got free money. How about you guys wanna fund this snowboard company? So we started doing some press and some boards through the summer into the season. And it was a lot harder than I thought, especially like when you're dealing with other people's money, you know, and, and just, it, was, it wasn't easy. We actually hit up Mike and Pete to make the boards for us. And when we called Mike and Pete and said, we got this company, we started it, we did some prototypes, Mike, Pete, what do you guys say you guys are the designers and build the boards? We got these money guys. And Mike and Pete go, no, no, we can't do it because we're starting our own company, Liberace Technologies. <laughs> and then Matt and I were like, oh, man. All right, Joyride guys, never mind. You guys can just keep the company. It's all yours. We got to go do this thing with Mike and Pete. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah. I thought that yeah. happened after. No, it was at the same time. Okay. Yeah. So Matt and I, we actually ran a couple Joyride ads and there was all kinds of, we, it was actually up and running. And then those guys uh, that did it, they took the company and kind of made it go for a few years. I remember the company. Yeah. Then there was a famous poster. There's a LibTech poster you were on oh, a snowboard that looked border. like Solomon. The Solomon, Solomon graphics. That's when Solomon. Shalom. Yeah. When Solomon entered that, that whole ad campaign. And all of our brochures and everything was all based on the the, the Solomon ski graphic because Solomon had come in going, we are bringing to the United States the monocoque. And of course, all the lib decks were monocoque. And Mike and Pete were like, no, we did it first. So yeah, I did that stupid poster. And the whole ad campaign was pictures of me riding around on this ski board, right. which was the snowboard with the bindings mounted on the ski graphics and me mono skiing around on it. It was pretty horrible, but it was so horrible, it was good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's so, so horrible yeah. we're talking about yeah. it today. Yeah. 
snowboarding at that point is kind of a family thing because anybody that you see out there in the lift line that's on a snowboard is the minority out there and you're nodding your head. It's almost- Absolutely. Yeah. It was still in the phase of like just trying to convince to get people to understand that in POW, this tool is so much better. You have to try it. That was really the mission, you know, is just to give people this tool that makes riding POW something that they just can't imagine. Another thing that you were a pioneer of is summer camp. You were a counselor, I believe, at maybe the original High Cascade. Yeah, but even before that, we actually did a thing called, ironically, in the last year of GNU, it was called the GNU Summer Snowboard Farm. And we did a GNU camp with all of our pros and everybody came in to the GNU Summer Snowboard Farm up at the glacier. It was like Susie Riggins, myself, Chris Carroll, Matt Cummins, all the GNU people were the coaches and uh, we did that. And actually before that, the very, very first snowboard camp ever on the glacier was put on by myself and Mike Estes. And Mike Estes and I, uh, there was a skate shop in Portland called Rebel Skates and it was called the Rebel Snowboard Camp. And Mike and I came up with the idea and ran it through the skate shop and we only did one session and we had like five people and it was 1987, 88. In the early days of camps, I'm going to talk about High Cascade because mm-hmm. yeah. uh, it's the one I know of. Yeah. What were the rules like back then? Did we use it pretty much a free-for-all of whatever <laughs> you wanted to do? It was a lot looser than you would imagine. I'm sure that there were – I'm sure <laughs> – I'm just like, ooh, yeah. No, it was loose. Yeah, it was, it was way loose. There were no rules, really. We just wanted to get people up on the glacier and hit some jumps and snowboard and – we were making it up as we went along. Absolutely. And who were the players back then? Did you have visiting pros coming into camp um, or were pros just hanging out at camp? Yeah. I mean, you got to use that word pro real loosely. I mean, yeah, Palmer's hang in the mix, hanging out on the glacier at this point. He was always a, a nutty glacier person. And Circe Wallace was a young, young girl at that point. And she was kind of ripping around. And you had Jamie Lynn, of course, starting to kind of come up as a young guy. Temple Cummins. Yeah, the glacier was an interesting hotbed at that point of just evolution. I mean, nobody had any idea where we were going. We created the camps so we could basically fund ourselves to be on the glacier, of course, right? Yeah. I mean, that was, that was the reason. And it worked, and it evolved, and obviously it turned into a completely real and lucrative business venture. For you, it was lucrative as well? Or were you just more of a counselor? You know, I ended up leaving the camp scene. I was there from 88 to 98 for a good solid 10 years. I was involved up there. I never got too involved on a professional executive level. Yeah. I did do a lot of work, you know, with High Cascade and with Wendell as well. And it was good times. I was a freelancer, essentially, just helping with lots of different things from media to hosting people to coaching. Stuff like that, yeah. Cool. And then at that time, there's a skier-snowboarder rivalry comes up. I wouldn't even call it a skier-snowboarder rivalry. I would say snowboarders didn't like skiers at that point, it seemed like. Maybe it was a punk rock ethos of, you're not going to accept us, well, fuck you. But what was that all about? Because you're on the front lines of that at that point. You know, it's funny, because for me, I love skiing, always have. And I was never involved in that. You were aware that that existed. Oh, I was aware that it it existed, but I was never really in the mix of it. And again, you know, I was a Northwest kid. And as you well know, Cascadia from Mount Bachelor to Mount Hood to Mount Baker to Whistler is a completely different animal than Summit County, Colorado and Aspen. And granted, things have mellowed out a lot more, but Colorado has always been, you know, historically speaking, has been the epicenter of winter sport. And when people from the East Coast say, I'm going out West to go skiing, they're not going out West. They're going to the middle of America. It's called Denver. Yeah. You know, it's the middle of America. No, the West Coast is Baker, Bachelor, Hood, Shasta, you know, Whistler. Yeah. And I don't believe that that skier snowboarder rivalry existed here like it did in the East Coast and in Colorado. I just don't think it ever did. I never had a problem. I mean, I was shredding with tons of skier guys. We thrived off of each other, you know, and pushed each other. I mean, I remember being here at Bachelor and ski racer buddies of mine, we would switch equipment 
like middle of the day, we'd go in the lodge and take all our gear off and just swap gear, and then they'd be on my snowboard. Did you ever get paid to snowboard? Um, sure. Yeah. Like, how much was the most you think you made in a year? And I know that since you're so old, that the money's going to change. If it was a dollar, that's like ten dollars now. It's impossible for me to answer that question in detail because there's a better way to answer it. Okay. I'm really not that great of a snowboarder. There are so many people that are so much more talented than I've ever been. Timing is everything. And again, timing is everything. And I snowboard well. I can snowboard anywhere well. Not an expert, not the best. I've never, ever been the best at any part of snowboarding. I've been on the podium a bunch of times, just on the right day, right place. When you were the best that day, you, when I no was the big best, deal. When I was the best that day. <laughs> but, but really, for me, I built my career with longevity in mind. I knew that I had to be well-versed in journalism. I had to be well-versed in aiding people with snowboarding almost. And in a way, it sounds, I don't want to use the word politician, but I had to become a liaison for snowboarding, not a pro. And so people might have looked at me as a pro and I might have been sponsored, but I always made sure that I never took more than I really deserved. I never asked for more than I did really deserve. I always wanted to under promise and over deliver. That's what I did. And so if you put my career on a graph, it's just been up until today sitting in this room with you right now. I come from very humble. Like I said, my dad was a photographer. My mom made pottery. I don't come from big money or big family wealth or anything. I was born into a very loving, very grassroots, very humble family. And I just have been just slowly building my socioeconomic path, we'll call it, all through snowboarding, just gradually up here till today. I've always been happy. I've always been stress-free. I've never been put in a position that I had to burn somebody. I never had to burn a contract. I never had to have somebody be angry at me because I cheated them. And that was always my goal because I wanted kind of an idealistic pathway where longevity was the was the goal did you think you made like 10 grand uh i've never i mean i i've never i mean i don't know i I, i'm not even sure in snowboarding there becomes a point where the snowboarder becomes the marketable entity right at this point i think the big crazy contract in snowboarding is jeff brushy he goes over to ride and I don't know if you remember that or any yeah. details, but it was like a half a million dollars Something and he went crazy. over there. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that was the number was around there. Yeah. I could be wrong, but yeah. that was in 1992 because that's when Ride was founded and I believe that was yeah. their big acquisition. I don't know much about inflation, but I know if it was a half a million dollars in 1992, <laughs> it would have been a lot more today. Yeah. So it's a significant amount of money and it immediately makes the snowboarder much more valuable than almost any skier on the planet because no yeah. skier was getting any money yeah. like that. I just got an email from Jeff Brushy yesterday, actually. Just saying how he invested a little bit of that 500 Yeah, no, grand. no. We were, we were talking about camera gizmos. He was asking me for camera advice. You know, Jeff, he's a remarkable dude. He's so peaceful and just he's got such a level head and he is rad. And I hope he made a lot of money because <laughs> he's, he's awesome. See, I've never been a product mover. Jeff Brush, he's a product mover. No, I didn't even almost yeah. know who you were at first, to be yeah. completely honest. Yeah. But I mean, everybody knows who Brushy was. Absolutely. Is, and yeah. can name like three of his graphics. They probably played craps on one of them. Yeah. Some people are product movers just by default. But there's a lot of people that have made a lot of effort to be famous or to really be that, or try to force it. Make an image for themselves. Make these artificial images where they basically stretch themselves beyond what they really tangibly can deliver. And that's okay. It's a free market economy. People can do whatever they want within the laws, of course, of civil obedience. (laughs) But that's not me. And I always wanted to make sure that I delivered value back to the industry that I believed in. So for me, it was finding lots of different pathways. A lot of it was television, media building television shows to bring in the Jeff Brushies because Jeff Brushy couldn't make a television show about himself, but I could figure out a way to make a television show. I had just enough athletic ability that it gave me just enough clout, but yet I had enough creative ability to talk to people outside the, the circle. 
And then I could make the television show and call Jeff and go, Jeff, I've totally got this. Come on over. I'm going to get you paid and we're all going to work together and do something awesome. And that's what I do. Being on the team and being that guy, eventually that transitions into the media role that you took. Absolutely. And the voice that you hear, a lot of people heard probably what, X Games, Olympics. Yeah, I, my voice was around pretty solidly for about 12 years. Do you make good money with your voice? Way better than snowboarding? Oh, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yes, absolutely. Journalism has definitely paid my bills. Okay. For sure. Not snowboarding. You're able to stay in snowboarding. You're able to stay in all these sports being a journalist. And you're almost treated better than the athletes. It's like you're brought everywhere and you don't have to perform. It's a different world. And even in that world... I did a lot of behind the scenes stuff because I knew that I wasn't going to be, I was going to get older. I wasn't a hot girl. I mean, I'm realistic about it. There's a reason that the Kardashians have a TV show and it's because they're these babelicious something somethings. I'm not even sure. Do you watch that? No, I don't. But they have their, and I I don't want to sound disrespectful towards them because all the power to capitalism, but They're narcissists. They've done nothing to warrant any sort of opinion in anything. They're not scientists. They're not researchers. The father was in the whole OJ thing, and the OJ specials were cool. (laughs) Okay. But you see what I'm saying. Yeah. And whatever, you know, they've produced a, a brand for themselves and all the power to them. And if they're making people happy, then great. But, and again, they're just a placeholder. I don't mean to pick on them, but they are narcissists by the true sense of the word they've done nothing to warrant having an opinion about anything really you know yeah i mean the osbournes at least did something yeah i mean exactly you grew up with ozzy osbourne you had some weird shit go down ozzy of course is a godfather of metal and a bunch of other music genres whatever you want to put him into i guess we're going down a little bit of a rabbit hole but i heard you do that (laughs) yeah Yeah. So again, back to the, you know, the journalism thing, it's like I, I knew that I'm not going to be the greatest journalist in the world either. So I just always try to make sure that I bring value to the greater good because it for me, it's like I don't want to get rich quick. I'm interested in the longevity and the health of this community that I was born into and have been lucky enough to live into. And so I don't need to take the whole pie. I just want to have just a little piece of the pie and try to help all of us succeed and keep this snow skate surf thing moving forward into the future because I do believe that it will breed a better human than a lot of other emotional and physical outlets that people can choose from. I'm going to brush over your announcing career. Yeah. The biggest thing you did, how many Olympics did you do? I was involved with two Olympics. Weirdest interview or moment you had on live television? The weirdest moment that I had on live television television was the best one ever was winter x games i think i was with steve ruff maybe and todd richards we were on camera and sports center was right next to us on a stage and there's a woman this famous woman on sports center and i can't think of her name robin roberts no wasn't it but like a super pro like basketball know-it-all genius like super woman like broadcaster okay. lady and her name was what I can't remember, but super famous on Smart Center. Let's just say her name was Linda. I'm just making that up. There is like a Linda Cohen, I think. Or oh, Cohen. that's her. Okay. Yeah, Linda. Let's, Let's just say her Linda name Cohen. was Linda. Yeah, no. Okay, that is it. Yeah, it is Linda Cohen. Yeah, is that right? Yeah. It's either Cohen or Cohen. I don't know. Yeah, but Linda. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's her. She's old. She's like older probably. Maybe she's like 50 now or something. I'm sure she'll love yeah. to be called older. Sorry. I mean, she's rad. Like no, I'm super kidding. smart, like sports woman. So she's thrown to us and she goes, something, blah, 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 snowboarding. And like, I'm going to throw it over to, to JMO, however she said it. And just out of my mouth on live television comes this. Linda, I love the way you say my name. <laughs> <laughs> Creepy. <laughs> yeah. And the ESPN guys lost it. Like they were dying like people just laughing like people were pulling their mics away because everybody's just (laughs) cracking up 
there was like this awkward silence with Richards and, and all of us. And then it just everybody <laughs> burst out laughing and it was like fully alive and it went out. I don't even know where it came from. I was like, whoa, did I just say that? Sorry. When you're doing roles like that in the media, you probably meet a lot of people other than the athletes that you're dealing with that just might be coming on set or whatever. And did you get to meet anybody that was cool that was outside of your world? Um, I... The most fascinating people that you've had the opportunity to meet that you could listen to them talk for hours. Oh, man. That's a tough one because it's a pretty powerful question. But you know what does make me think of is Sal Masakela. And the reason that I bring up Sal is I'm a little bit older than he is, but I think that it has been probably one of the most incredible experiences watching him create his career. And Sal is a wonderful dude. And I have had a great time watching him become who he is today. And there was a Sal at one point that kind of bugged me a little bit. We used to call him Sal Liberty. <laughs> because he was like in this weird thing where it seemed like he was trying too hard. Was that NBA Sal? Uh, it might have been NBA Sal. I'm not sure. I can't remember. But, you know, Steve Ruff and I nicknamed Sal Sal Liberty. It's a good one. But from when he started as the front desk kid at Transworld, that's where he started. You know, <sighs> Sal is not like some baller from Southern California. His dad came over from from Africa in the 60s and 70s you know, from South Africa as a musician. And I mean, Sal's story is incredible. He was just working the front desk and he taught himself to surf and snowboard. And the Sal Masakela that exists today is an incredible dude. Like he is philanthropic. He is powerful. He's on a mission for good. He has got such a good head on his shoulders and, and how he uses the platform that he has built for himself as a journalist he is using it in an incredibly powerful, positive ways. And if you don't know Sal, you should go and follow him on the social networks. He's got a show on Vice. And Sal has turned into an incredible human. When you say turned into, I wonder what he was before he turned into uh, that. Maybe that was the wrong choice of words. But the person that he has become is really cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. After all your media stuff, I don't know how you end up parlaying it into a gig that I think was really important to you the past decade was GoPro. Employee number what? 30. Okay. Basically, what happened is skateboarding pushed me towards all kinds of different things. You know, mountain biking. I was super involved in the onset of the whole free ride mountain bike movement, hitting jumps and skating and BMX and surfing. And I did a bunch of stuff with Don Bostic and World Cup skateboarding and Aaron Astorga and Dave Duncan and that crew for a while. You know, I had my fingers in a lot of different places, always connected to television and content in some level. So I was kind of this became this big buffered liaison between the then not so knowledgeable mainstream media and, of course, the core community of these sports. So along the way, just learned a lot of things. I learned how to operate a camera. I learned a lot of production skills, a lot of audio skills. I actually had a nationally syndicated radio show on ABC Radio Networks for about three years wow. under contract with Walt Disney. I got a check from Walt Disney. It was a rock and roll interview radio type show. Basically, it was this, except with music mixed in. What kind of music is your favorite music? If you were to buy a CD from the 1980s, 90s, what would it be? From the 80s or 90s? That's music that influenced you growing up. Because you can't be like hip to the new shit these days, I wouldn't think. Not really. I'm taking my kids to uh, Eugene this weekend because they got tickets to that guy, Tyler, the creator. He's like some new rap guy. Yeah. Right now, you're just saying you're not hip to the new shit. Yeah. But I'm going. I'm the dad taking my teenagers. I'm not sure exactly what that's going to happen, but... Weed. Weed. I know. Exactly. Weed. What's your favorite band? Oh, the music thing. You know... In 1984 to 1987 in high school, I remember the first thing that really rocked me was Matt Cummins turns me on to the Red Hot Chili Peppers, their original self-titled Red Hot Chili Peppers, Red Hot Chili Peppers cassette tape. Matt gave it to me as a gift and I was like, wow, this is unbelievable. I was not a big punk rock fan you know, like a lot of skaters were in the 80s. I was uh, more of a Grateful Dead Santana you drove a VW bus. I did. I went to a bunch of Grateful Dead shows. Ever try one of those little white pieces of paper? No, <laughs> no, no, no. 
you know, I might have done some testing for, you know, the big marijuana legalization projects that are going on in a lot of these states. I was involved in that legalization process back in the 80s. <laughs> you were doing illegal activity in the 1980s, but if you're doing it now, it'd be totally fine. Yeah. I'm over-exaggerating my involvement. But Santana, Grateful Dead sounds were my, more my thing. But then when I discovered the Red Hot Chili Peppers, I was like, oh my God, this is the best. Love the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I actually had a chance to work with them several times. Did they disappoint? Because sometimes when you meet yeah. heroes, they're regular dudes. I've been fortunate that I got to do a bunch of music stuff in my career, working closely with Jane's Addiction many times. That's pretty um, cool. Yeah, and they are wonderful. Dave Navarro is super cool. Perry Farrell is really a rad guy, but he Jewish. is- Jewish. He's on like, he's on another- plain like he's a very spiritual sometimes like he'll say stuff and i'll be like huh i won't understand exactly what he's getting at but that band those guys are so peaceful and so loving and just wonderful wonderful so easy to work with red hot chili peppers not so much except for the drummer chad chad is fantastic i did some drum workshop stuff with him and the dw drums has a thing called uh, the drum workshop Anyway, Chad from the Red Hot Chili Peppers is fabulous. Super easy to work with. Another guy I worked with a few times was Tenacious D and uh, Jack Black. So easy to work with. Those guys, Jack Black is outstanding human. And uh, the Foo Fighters, actually. You know, the Foo Fighters have some, a lot of history in snowboarding. One of my super close friends, actually, here in Oregon that I played in a band with, this guy named Joe Beebe, ended up working A1 with the Foo Fighters, and he's been with them for forever. He just retired, actually, after almost 20 years with the Foo Fighters or something. He was their production manager. Anyway, so I did some work with the Foo Fighters, uh, particularly on the White Limo album. They were rad, too. You've got a show. Anybody who comes down and sits down next to you, you expect them to be a normal person and at least um, civil. I do want to add one other band that I've done a bunch of work with is President of the United States of America. Those guys, fabulous. Same thing. God, those are guys. Are you talking are... about Casper Baby Pants? Yes, Casper Baby Pants. How do you know about Casper Baby Pants? They're all the rage in Seattle for kids six and under. That's Chris Ballou's new kids record thing that he's doing. It's fabulous. That is so great that you know Casper Baby Pants. They play West Seattle every once in a while. Oh my God, that'd be so fun. Yeah, so I'm not going to name any names, but the biggest pain in the ass to work with on the musical front for me actually is... <sighs> Man, I hate to say this because it's, I don't want to. I mean, if he's an asshole to you. No, I'm not going to name any names, but it's just in general, it's DJs and rappers. I don't know what it is. Like, you don't play an instrument, you're an, a computer operator, except for Mixmaster Mike. I did do one gig with Mixmaster Mike, the turntable is yeah. from the Beastie Boys, and that guy is super cool. So cool and just so humble and so awesome. But for the most part, DJs and marginally famous hip-hop artists that maybe aren't famous yet. Oh, it's just like, really, guys? Do you really need to carry a, a giant entourage with you and just make everything a pain in the ass? It's bizarre. I don't know what it is about DJs. They're the one group of performers that you consistently hear about getting shot, getting caught in the airport with a gun. You never hear about a metal band getting shot. No, except for the Eagles of Death Metal. Those poor guys well, got stuck in that that that's Paris terrorism, thing. though. Yeah, that was a bummer. Those poor guys. Yeah. Those guys are awesome. Eagles of Death Metal. You ever seen them? I've never seen. Oh, them. it's the best show. They're so good. Oh my gosh. But yeah, I don't know what it is. Yeah, you, you kind of write about that. I don't get it. It's like you're operating an Apple Macintosh. Can you show a little bit more courtesy and a little less ego, please? Yeah. So GoPro. You get to GoPro, you're employee yeah. number 30, and this business is insane. Yeah. It is skyrocketing. Right. Your first three years there have to be the most exciting time of a business that you've ever yeah, been a was, part of. It was nuts. I guess originally you had asked me how did I end up at GoPro, but it was just all these experiences that I had dabbled in so much. I had run into Nick Woodman and his buddy, super close friend of his named Justin Wilkenfeld. They came to the cycling trade show in Vegas for the first time. And I had had a friend that was on the Yamaha factory supercross team for Yamaha. And Nick had sponsored the Yamaha motocross team with his first tiny little video camera and only shot video for like 10 seconds. And so that was my in to Nick because this motocross buddy of mine said, yeah, he showed me this camera that he got. And I'm like, whoa, that's really cool. 
And I got it and I played with it and I was like, yeah, it's a piece of crap, but I get it. And so my motocross buddy, his name is Landon Courier, hooked me up with Nick and Justin. I met him at the cycling show just to meet him. And I walked up to him and I said, you know what? Your camera, it's a piece of crap, obviously, but I get it. I get what you're trying to do. And I go, I've been playing with wired POV cams and stuff. I go, I get what you're trying to do. I'd love to just help you. You know, I'm not asking for a job. I don't need a job. And he goes, really? And he's like, yeah. So he sent me a bunch of cameras. I started experimenting with them, doing different footage. And you're a credible dude at that point. Yeah. I mean, I guess, yeah, I'm credible. I'm, I'm, you're not just some kid who's like, hey. Yeah. I'm not just some like random person. You're um, a personality uh, who's like, I see what you're trying to do and I want to help you. Yeah. And I, I'm interested in helping you. So for about a year, almost a year, I was working with him and, and sending him footage and giving him ideas and advice and whatever. And then in 2010, maybe it was pretty funny. My guy that was my head boss, I guess, at ABC Networks calls me and he goes, Hey, man, I got to tell you, I just got out of a meeting and we're totally changing the way that we are doing X games and all the stuff that you're doing. It's a total house cleaning. He goes, We're not renewing your contract. And I was just devastated. I was like, Oh my goodness. Cause that was like half my income, right? So I go to sleep at night. I look at my kids and my wife and I go, you guys, all the ABC stuff is gone. X Games, everything. They're doing a complete makeover. And my wife was like, oh man, you know? And the very next morning, Nick Woodman calls me on the phone and goes, I don't know what you're doing, but what would it take to have you work full time for me? <laughs> and I was like, wow, your timing is crazy good. And I was like, hell yeah, let's do this. We just dove in head first and it was awesome. The first four years and the first four cameras up through the HD cameras, it was incredible developing that product. Everybody in the world saw the growth. I think at the time up in Seattle, there was a little company called V Holder, which changed the name to Contour. <laughs> yeah. And then there was GoPro. I'm not sure, but I want to say that Contour might have had HD first. GoPro had marketing. Contour didn't. GoPro was able to take over that market. Contour didn't have the funding to even continue, and it became a GoPro world. Yeah, I mean, the V Holdar guys, and their their product was good. There was nothing wrong with their product. It was a good design. It had a lot of things that were great about it. I think their mistake is that they just didn't speak enough to the communities. They just kind of like sat there, and they went like, this is what we make, and they just weren't interested in being involved. That's where they blew it. They just sat there on their product hoping that people would buy it. And you were all about submit your shit. We're going to get it out there. And Yeah. Also, we were involved in the communities. That was the thing is that we went surfing and we went to the surf contests and we explained to people about what this camera was going to change. I mean, if there's any one sport that I think that the camera made the biggest impact on, it's surfing. The fact that this camera took viewers inside the barrel and people were able to see surfing like they've never seen it before. Yeah. And that was, that was cool. You're no longer with GoPro. Yep. I, uh, I've uh, left GoPro, uh, what, six months ago? And a shit ago. ton of people left GoPro. Yeah. There was a, a huge house cleaning there. They gutted a lot of people. And it's one of those things where you're in a category that you guys owned uh -huh. and it worked itself into it could be other competition. I'm not sure what happened, but did anybody there see the end coming? I mean, you guys had this IPO and you went public and did you guys get too big for your britches? How does it all work? Because everybody loves uh -huh. the company. Everybody swears by it who works there, I would think. It's something that you're really proud of. Yeah. You want everybody to enjoy and somehow it goes south. The company had a lot of really, really good people. And this is just a gut feeling. I have no facts yeah. to back this up at all. This is just an overall gut feeling. And I say this out loud because I think it can protect other companies if they listen to this or even other people. We all know this. Money and wealth has a has a very transformative mechanism to it that changes the way that humans interact with each other, the way that they 
make choices based on the goals, their own personal goals. Money is weird and it can create and pollute an environment that makes people make odd choices. GoPro fell victim to that just like a lot of other individuals and other companies. And that's what I think happened is there was so much wealth that it disabled the company's ability to make logical decisions about what they really stood for and what they really wanted to do. I think the company is going to be fine. It's leveling out. And I love GoPro and I I think it makes a fabulous product. It really still is to me the best action cam. And, you know, I use all the different cameras. I use every kind of camera. And and overall, the, the GoPro Hero 6 is still the best action camera out there overall. It's got its faults, sure. There's some other cameras that are better at certain things. But overall, it's still the best. And I think the new GoPro that exists today, all the old school guys are pretty much gone. Nick is still there. But I would think at this point, it's a different Nick. It's not the same dude who comes up to you with a little plastic piece of shit camera and is like, Uh, no, no, it's not that same guy, but he's got a a lot of pressure on his shoulders. He's got a lot of shareholders, right? He's got a lot of shareholders. Um, There's a lot of cooks in the kitchen now. It's a public company. I'll leave this with GoPro. Despite what anybody has to say about GoPro, there's one thing with Nick at the helm there. In his heart, Nick is a wonderful husband a wonderful father, and he does genuinely care. He cares about the people's health, particularly, I'll call it their emotional health. He does care about the people around him. He might be a billionaire now, and maybe that's affected a little bit of his ability to do whatever, but Nick's a good dude, and I wish him the best of luck, and I and I hope that he and GoPro come out of this and they surface as the GoPro that they deserve to be. I'm getting a message from Nick right now. He's saying he yep. wishes you the best of luck as well. <laughs> Bad. And thank you for all the hard work. Yeah. You are the most active person I've ever emailed with because we just met tonight. You knew that I was coming in town. You didn't really know how many hours I was going to be here for because it's not long. But you offered about 46 sports that we were going to do together. And to other people that I talked about, that is how you are. You're a hospitable guy who's not only like, hey, we can do all this, but You'd show up at a trail with mountain bikes for all, you know, like, hey, I've got an extra couple bikes in my car. Let's get these guys out with us. And you're just always wanting to everybody to have a good time. And judging from this interview, you've never been about greed. You seem like you're a really good person at heart. You probably could have been a lot richer than you were, but you were too good of a person to be that way. And there's something to be. That's the respectable thing. I lived pretty stress free. I have a wonderful marriage. I have three kids. My wife is just so supportive. I mean, of all the travel that she's had to put up with and all the the weeks of like sometimes I, I mean, I went on this trip to Japan last year and I was gone for two weeks and she was just all three kids at the house by herself, you know, and she just troopers it out, you know, even right now we're down here at the shop. It's, you know, the witching hour at home, you know, kids getting in bed for school and I haven't gotten a single text that says like, when are you coming home? <laughs> yeah, nope, she's incredibly supportive and just a wonderful woman. Yeah, and hopefully when she hears this, she'll be like, wow, he is so nice. <laughs> and you'll get paid that night. Yeah, paid. <laughs> but I uh, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me here. And keep in touch when you're in Seattle. Let me know. I'll do the same when I'm down here. Yeah, keep up the good work. Like I said, uh, when I heard you were coming, I went and checked out your work. And I am very, very impressed. What a great compliment from a guy who has a body of work like Chris Jameson to be impressed with what I'm doing. Well, that makes me feel really good. It also made me feel really good to meet JMO as I knew of his exploits, but I didn't really know how cool of a guy he was. And I'm going to head back to Ben this winter and shred a little bit with JMO as he put out the invitation and I will take him up on it. I need to let you know that next week, we have another great interview. My guest, she had an incredible season last year. Her name is Kimmy Fasani, and we are going to talk a lot about her snowboard career as her life is about to change in a major way. I will tell you all about that on the podcast next week. Until then, I want to ask you to follow me on Instagram at The Powell Movement. I also want to ask you to support my sponsors as they support me and help make the show happen. 
They are Evo.com, DieCutStickers.com, Sierra Tahoe Resort, Rescue Water, and Unofficial Networks. Finally, I want to thank you for tuning in each week. Have a great week, everyone.